every 90 seconds, someone is reported missing. Many return to their families, but for others, something has gone seriously wrong. A 15-year-old girl has gone missing. I just couldn't believe that she hadn't been to school. By the time um, Linda Jones dialed 999, she'd been missing all day. It's immediately a high-risk case. We were approaching summer holidays and the community were very concerned about a potential predator at loose. What happens in the police investigation that follows? We identified some 30 victims over a 20-year period. What happens to the family at its heart? Well, you like to think you should protect your children and obviously I feel, I feel that I let her down. I didn't protect her. When missing turns to murder. Danielle was a very shy girl, um, lacked self-confidence, um, but she had quite a big group of friends. She was a very fun, loving girl. She had a good sense of humour. Just a really happy, fun, loving teenage girl, really. If Danielle ever went out to make friends or shopping, there would never be a time where I didn't know what she, where she was. She was always um, would tell me where she was going. She had her breakfast as normal. She was always the one to be running late, always. She left at 10 to 8 most mornings. She went out the door as normal, said goodbye to me as normal. Danielle's brother Mitchell is watching from the window. That morning, he watched her go out of the gate and turn left, which was her normal route to school, and within seconds watched her turn around and walk back past the house the other way which was very unusual, but at the time he didn't say to me, she's, it was, it's just perhaps she was going round to the shop. So at that particular time, he didn't mention it because it wasn't of any relevance that morning. Heard absolutely nothing till, I think it was probably about half past two. I had a phone call from the school to say, was Danielle unwell? She hadn't been at school, which horrified me because that wasn't, something she'd do. She was a bit of a scaredy cat. Not that she would have been punished punished for it, but she just wouldn't have ever dared do something like that. It got to half three and I started to phone her school friends. They didn't seem to any of them have heard from her or anything, which was very strange. The whole thing was just not not her character to do this and I think I then began to panic a little bit. I phoned the police and just said, explained that she'd gone to, gone out to school that morning was normal. Good evening, Mrs. Chris. Of course, can I help you? Oh, yes, I wonder if you can. Um, if you go to my daughter. Yeah. How old's your daughter? Though? 15. 15. And how long has she been missing her? I think eight o'clock this morning. Any missing child, there is always the potential that something dreadful may have happened to them. And that is why missing children are given such a high priority. So in this case, Danielle had never been missing before, and by the time um, Linda Jones dialed 999, she'd been missing all day and into some of the evening. So Linda's distress was totally understandable. It was initially dealt with by the local divisional police as a, as a high-risk missing person. She was a girl that wasn't worldly wise. She was afraid of the dark and there'd been no instance of her truanting at all from school before. Missing people generally go missing for a variety of reasons. Maybe some sort of cry for help. It may be, um, particularly with children, that they've fallen out with their parents and, and they see this as causing stress on their parents and um, solving whatever problems they've got. I just couldn't believe that she hadn't been to school. I just don't think I could comprehend that she'd not done what she would normally do. I don't think I, I believe that she would have bunked off school. I, I don't think I really knew what to think, to be quite honest with you. I thought but by, say, six o'clock, she'll turn up and say, oh, with, the, with a story, oh, I, went, I didn't go to school. I thought she'd just walk in with a story at any point, but I think I was just in total disbelief of, of what had gone on in that day. I stayed here with, with a close friend in case she did come home. Um, and just friends and, and family were just trawling around the estate, going to the train station, waiting there to see if she got off a train. 
everyone was just out looking around the local area for hours and hours. The first 24 hours were very critical. Obviously the whereabouts, last sightings, had you taken a mobile phone, had you taken a change of clothing, uh, had you taken cash, there was only potential for her to catch public transport, really just trying to trace down her movements. Danielle's been missing all day. Her mum Linda and dad Tony speak to everyone who knows her, friends and family. I think on the Monday evening, Tony had gone round to his sister's house um, to see whether they'd heard from her. And he couldn't get any answer, but through the window there was a lot of camera equipment out, which he thought was quite a bizarre thing to be doing. And everyone was out looking, but he wasn't. It didn't sit right with him, didn't sit right with Tone at all. Uh, when Tone came home, Tone was quite agitated about it. I don't think at that time I really thought that much of it. I think my fault focus was mainly on where is she? Where is, is she coming home? I, I think I took on board what he said, but I don't think at that moment it was that relevant to me. I, I was just more concerned about where she was, why didn't she come home? As night falls, Danielle is still missing. It was the following morning when I first became aware of uh, Danielle's uh, disappearance. Um, it, there was a call in from the police, I believe, and the then editor and his head of news desk were clearly concerned about what might be developing. The police I think came back that day, we had um, the, do the sniffer dogs came and walked all around the estate in which they established the route she'd taken. They could tell that she'd walked so far and, and retraced her steps, they, they were able to ascertain that. And I, I just think I was in total shock that a, a girl that never really would put a foot out of line suddenly went to school yesterday and, and hadn't come home. I, I, I don't think at that point I thought anything sinister had happened. I just hoped, I think, that she would come home. The, the first three days, inquiries were made with school friends, um, searches were made of her home address, but no particular relevant evidence was found at that time. Eventually, the search expanded and every house in East Tilbury, the village where she lived, was visited by the police and the occupants of every address were spoken to and asked to check their sheds and outbuildings just to make sure that Danielle was not hiding there. But as hours went by, it became clear to Gray's police that something awful may have happened. And that's when it was referred to headquarters to the major investigation section. Danielle Jones has been missing for three days. The investigation steps up a gear. When they turned up, it was quite a shock, really, because although we'd had police in and out since the Monday, this sort of took a whole different level. DC Ed Mayo is the family liaison officer assigned to the Jones family. When you deploy to a family, you don't know what the family setup is, what the dynamics of the family. You don't know what the relationship between uh, mum and dad is, are they still together, or, or what siblings there are. And if we were going to find out exactly what Danielle was like, what her routine was, where she'd like to go, who did she associate with, that's all going to come from within the family. We had several police come in. I was taken upstairs and asked to give statements. Tone was sat down here, asked to give statements. It was just a completely different level. I needed to, uh, alibi statements from both Tony and Linda, um, try and exclude them as being suspects. We want to search her room and the whole house. So actually, very quickly, I've got to build up a report and start getting the things that we want. What we're trying to achieve is all the information we can about Danielle and about the family. She had a, a quite a close-knit group of friends girlfriends who actually they, they did lots together shopping typical teenage girls but Danielle was a uh, quite naive in the way she was she was a, a, a really nice kid they raised concerns about her relationship with her uncle which until that time I don't think they had been unduly concerned about but now that she was missing I think they began 
to become very worried about what that relationship was all about. Danielle Jones has been missing for three days. There's suspicion that her uncle, Stuart Campbell, is involved. I think Tony the suspicions because he knew Campbell uh, had a bit of a past. He had some sort of glamour photography business, although he was actually a builder by trade. The family may have suspicions. The police need to find evidence. Initial inquiries by Gray's police and then confirmed by the major investigation team centred around a blue van, the driver of which was seen speaking to a girl fitting Danielle's description. There was also sightings of an altercation between somebody matching Danielle's description with a man in a blue van. Danielle's uncle, Stuart Campbell, owns a blue van. Once the information regarding the blue van came to my notice, it confirmed my worst fears that she had been abducted. I recall pretty quickly a press conference being set up. A huge story was unfolding. There was national press. It was clear that um, there was some real concern around uh, what happened to Danielle. In a case where a child goes missing, the police rely heavily on the media to put out appeals, appeals for witnesses, appeals for information. Over the years, you see parents giving press conferences of children that have gone missing, and your heart goes out to them, and then suddenly to be the mother and father, having to actually do that yourself is is unreal, the fact that you, you've got to actually beg your child to come home or beg whoever is stopping your child coming home to let them come home. It's just a completely unreal situation. It's horrendous, absolutely horrendous thing to have to go through. It's like being thrown into the lion's den, to be honest. I met Stuart pretty much um, within weeks of meeting Tony, really, because he was going out with Tony's sister. He was a bit of a charmer, very full of himself, but... There was always something with Tone and him that Tone wasn't 100% with him, but he still couldn't have told you he didn't like him, because he did. Stuart's relationship with the children when they were small was great, used to play with them, treat all of them exactly the same. And I would say not until year 18 months before Danielle went missing that he would take more of an interest in Danielle. But I think the boys were growing up then and weren't so interested in playing silly games with their uncle. Initially, he didn't pay much attention to her, but once she became a teenager, he seemed to become very friendly with her, very interested in what she was doing. It became apparent that um, her uncle, Stuart Campbell, was quite a, an influence in her life at that time. The more you delved into Tony and Linda's relationship with Danielle, it was almost seemed, from a, an outsider's point of view, that he had been there driving a the wedge in between Danielle and Linda, and he had put himself in that position as um, a comforting uncle, but his intentions were more than comforting. Got on fine with him. We just fitted in all together as a family. No reason to distrust him in any way, really. It certainly became clear from her friends that they, they thought that Daniel was having, what, in their words, an inappropriate relationship with Stuart Campbell. Friends would say initially uh, she was uh, not unhappy with this attention. As the time drew on, clearly she became more and more frustrated and, and anxious about the attention that Stuart Campbell was giving her. We know that actually he spent a lot of time coming to the house and speaking to Danielle quietly to one side. I think they'd been to the pictures together. I think one of her friends said that they thought she saw her holding hands. So it became apparent that perhaps actually the relationship between a, an uncle and his niece wasn't um, perhaps as, as it should be. As Campbell became more and more of interest, inquiries were made into his background and it was ascertained that he'd had a previous conviction about a year earlier for abducting a 14-year-old girl where he'd received 
a suspended prison sentence. So clearly our concerns about him as a predator were there and were absolutely real. And when we started to look at his background, we identified some 30 victims over a 20-year period. And there'd been a very common uh, modus operandi with Campbell. He posed as a glamour photographer and he would approach young girls in the Greys area, uh, and particularly when they were around 13, 14, starting to become young women. And basically, uh, he was so confident in his own ability that he would encourage these young girls back to his home address where he would take inappropriate photographs of them on, on the premise that they were going to be uh, model photographs. I, I don't think I really knew that he did photography particularly, but we became to know that a young girl had been um, to the police because she said he wanted to take photos of her and wouldn't let her out of the house. We didn't know all the details of that at the time. Apparently he was taken in for questioning, but let off. And we were told, oh, it was all a big misunderstanding. The girl had a bit of a hissy fit. She wanted him to take some photos. It was all very much brushed off and under the carpet. We thought nothing of it, but we didn't. It was just, oh, it's a big misunderstanding. Campbell had actually convinced them post-trial that he was an innocent victim and he wasn't guilty of this offence. So they knew of the background of it, but they dismissed it, obviously up until the time Daniel went missing. Campbell was a concern to the investigation. He was somebody, a person of interest, who we needed to either implicate or eliminate. They had looked into him and found out this history he'd got, and I don't think that from any point there was ever any other suspect. As you can imagine, in, in a week now since Daniel has gone missing, uh, the community concern is really heightened. We were approaching summer holidays and the community were very concerned about a potential predator at loose and young people. That The world's media really were on our case. Um, so there was a real level of intensity around that. And of course, in the background, your ultimate aim is to try and find uh, Daniel safely and return her to her home. We conducted surveillance on him on that Friday, the 22nd of June, to try and ascertain where Daniel was. We believe that he may be involved in her abduction and it would have been very easy to arrest him there and then, but there was some concern and hope that Daniel was still alive. The, the few hours of sleep you managed to, to have in all this time, which it was few and far between, you'd wake up and for that split second, it wasn't there. And then it, it like stabs you in the stomach that, oh my God, Danielle's not home. We don't know where she is. We don't know what's happened. It, it's an absolutely awful feeling. It, it's, it is like you're... Well, you're a bit like a zombie, you're just not living in any sort of real world. You're still trying to sort the boys out, get them to school, trying to be normal, but you're just, you're just living in a complete daze. He was acting in a very strange way and certainly not the way that a, a concerned uncle would naturally be. He seemed to be spending time driving to car parks, taking photographs of silver cars which matched the description of his own Nissan Primera and in some bizarre way appeared to be sort of building an alibi in for himself. Following that surveillance, which lasted several hours, he was then arrested. Stuart Campbell was arrested around about midnight and he was interviewed quite intensely. They were worried about your relationship with Danielle. Tell me what it was about her, Stuart. Why you wanted to be with her. No comment. So his initial alibi for his movements on the 18th of June was that he'd travelled to a local DIY store at Rayleigh and then he had returned home straight away before working at his neighbour to do some decking work later on that morning. But his decision to go no comment, I think, concreted or cemented in our mind that he was a primary suspect. I don't think I thought she was dead because I don't think I would, could conceive that her uncle would hurt her. I think probably at that point I thought, well, he's got her somewhere. Why would he hurt her? There was certainly uh, an element of Tony and Linda now having a backward look at the intensity in which Stuart Campbell had been with Daniel at their home address and certain things, I think, were dropping into place that they now had real concerns about. There was insufficient evidence to charge him, so he was released on bail. The police dig deeper for more evidence. Everything is checked, and checked again. When they searched her bedroom, Danielle's bedroom, in her pencil case there were two notes. 
which um, said hello princess and that was a nickname that um, Campbell had given to um, Danielle. It's believed that actually Campbell put those in her room while she was away on her school field trip because Campbell previously had done some work around Tony Linda's house and fitted a new back door. Uh, although we never found the keys, it was believed that actually he had a key to that house and that it gave him easy access when Tony and Linda weren't there. Simultaneous searches are carried out at Stuart Campbell's family home. A team conducted a thorough search of Campbell's house, including searching his loft. And in that loft, a bag was discovered containing a number of significant articles. In the bag was found a pair of white hold-up stockings and on one leg of the stockings we found a, a small item of blood and when that was subject to further examination there was a mixed DNA profile of Danielle and Stuart Campbell in that stain. That was very hard to explain to Tony Linda that actually there are a pair of stockings in a, a bag that effectively has some sort of sexual nature to it uh, and Danielle's um, DNA was on those stockings. It was very hard. I think it was hard for Tony. He felt helpless and hopeless that he couldn't do anything and that it's terrible, but also it's very good evidence to convict him. All the indicators are pointing police to one conclusion. I believe Campbell had an obsession regarding Danielle, one that developed since she became a, a teenager. And the nature of that relationship is still unknown to us. It was certainly inappropriate and probably unlawful. We honestly believe that Daniel's been murdered. Campbell was our, our main suspect. We believed it. We just needed to prove it. 15-year-old Danielle Jones has disappeared. Police believe that she's been murdered by her uncle, Stuart Campbell. At that time, from June the 23rd, we were satisfied that he was the person responsible for Danielle's disappearance. But that couldn't be relayed to the public because we could only name an offender once they're charged. There's some real momentum now with this story and it, it's clear now that this is no longer a missing persons um, investigation and the severity w was clear. At this point, they started to do search areas. They did on the Saturday, I believe it was, a public search down by the Thames, which is, is literally down the road to us. There was almost like a, an, an eerie silence and seriousness within the, the people involved and their determination to, to try and help the family and, and come up with something in, in the search. There was, uh, I remember being taken aback by how many people had actually got involved in something like that at such short notice. There was always that anticipation that something at any moment could be turned up that could be a significant piece of evidence or, or something even worse. And there was always that heightened feel about any of those searches. The only person that wasn't involved was her uncle. Surely he would be the first one to be involved when he had a close relationship with her, thought a lot of her, and yet he was probably the only person I could think of that never got involved in searching for her. Linda's hopes were always that Daniel was going to just walk straight back in. Linda realised actually when we started searching deep water uh, and we were looking uh, in uh, disused buildings and it was really ramping up, we believe. The hypothesis is Daniel has been murdered. We're looking for a body and this is why we are searching in these places. They were searching in the local area with um, police that were searching underwater and I think that tipped me over the edge a little bit. I think part of me knew, but a bigger part of me didn't want to know, didn't want to accept that that is what the outcome was going to be. And I think the more the investigation went on and the more we were told, I knew she was dead, but you still can't, can't quite get that that slither of hope that, well, they're wrong, she's going to walk through the door. The first contact we had from Danielle wasn't to us. It was to her uncle. 
he was very keen to show them a text message that he'd received on his phone from Danielle, which said, Hi Stu, what are you up to? I'm in so much trouble. Just hearing that someone had had contact for me was a bit of a relief. She's alive. Everything will be all right. It's going to be ups and downs until that point, but she's alive. And you cling to that hope for the amount of time until you hear anything different. I clung to the hope that, well, someone's heard from her, so she, everything's fine. It's obviously an issue, but she's fine. And I think that's all I cared about at that, at that moment. Linda obviously is really upset at this point. She can't understand why uh, Daniel hasn't contacted her, why she hasn't come home, and why she would contact Stuart Campbell. As days went on, and as they became aware of Stuart Campbell's background, they then realised that this wasn't such positive news. It was, in fact, quite sinister news. Once the investigation's progressing, we sought the assistance of a range of experts. The introduction of a telephone expert into the inquiry really cemented our view that Stuart Campbell had lied about his alibi on the 18th of June. Campbell had said that at the time Danielle went missing, on her way to school that morning, that he was at a do-it-yourself shop in Rayleigh, and that, having been to that shop, first of all, he didn't buy anything, which was suspicious, but on returning back to the Greys area, he was delayed, and that he telephoned his wife. When self-site analysis was carried out regarding that phone call that he made to his wife, it was proved that his telephone was actually not in Rayleigh, but that it, the call was made from the East Tilbury, Corringham area. That was strong evidence that Campbell was lying. We also employed the services of a forensic linguist to actually analyse the language she was using in those text messages and compared it to language that she'd used in other text messages which we knew that she was sent and they were very, very different. In one of the messages that Stuart Campbell had sent to his own phone purporting to be Daniel, he'd used the word what, spelt W-O-T. Daniel never spelt the word what, she spelt it in the normal spelling. The fact that the self-site analysis proved that his phone and Danielle's phone were so close together during the first couple of days that she was missing was significant evidence. As inquiries developed regarding Stuart Campbell, once we learnt more about his background, once we identified his predilection for girls of Danielle's age, it really only confirmed my fears that she'd been murdered. Inquiries continued regarding him and other offences that he had committed came to light. Inquiries regarding his computer identified that he'd been taking photos of other young women, some without their consent, so on the 17th of August, when he answered his bail, he was re-arrested and charged with those offences. In the background, police are building their case against Campbell for Danielle's murder. We had so much circumstantial evidence that the case to us appeared to be very strong, notwithstanding Danielle hadn't been located. We worked with the Crown Prosecution Service and between November, when he was charged with murder and kidnap, there was then almost a year before the trial. I can't believe this, that someone who had watched Daniel grow up from a baby could end up doing something like this. It's, it's just, you always assume that children that go missing or anyone that gets murdered is is something quite a random thing to happen from someone you don't know. I don't think in a million years I would have ever dreamt someone in my own family would have done this. 
Linda and Tony were very angry, angry that they had allowed Campbell into their home, allowed that relationship to develop and not noticed it. People did say, how did you not know? How did you not know that that was going on? And it was just, he was very clever, manipulative. He knew what he was doing when he was um, speaking with um, Danielle, when he was like pushing that barrier between him, her and um, Linda. And it's just difficult because you, you don't see it. If you, unless you aware of it, you just don't see it. He was very clever. So I think that was where the anger stemmed from, that actually perhaps they could have stopped it previously, but didn't because they didn't know. It was shock in the community that an uncle of Danielle had been charged with her murder and kidnap. At the same time, I think there was some relief that there wasn't still someone at large who may be responsible for abducting young girls. Stuart Campbell has been charged with kidnap and murder, but sightings of Danielle are still being reported to police. As a result of all the appeals that Essex Police made, we had 830 different sightings, alleged sightings of Danielle throughout England, United Kingdom, Europe, and some other places in the world. The sightings, there were hundreds and hundreds of sightings that went on for months and months. Um, I think the sightings did initially give me hope that, oh, yeah, she's been seen, but then as I, I sort of would be out or, or myself see girls from the back and even myself think it was her, I think the reality that any of them probably were her was fading. This provided a massive logistical problem for Essex Police, particularly after Campbell had been charged with murder, because every sighting had to be investigated and eliminated, because if there was the slightest chance that Danielle was alive and that particular sighting had not been properly investigated, it would have been easy for the defence to raise that during the trial and leave some shadow of doubt that Daniel was still alive and therefore the case of murder could not be proved. 43-year-old Stuart Campbell has been charged with the kidnap and murder of his 15-year-old niece, Danielle. Her brothers need to be told what's happened. When um we had to tell the boys that that uncle had been uh, arrested and was responsible for Danielle's disappearance. It was a really difficult time. Mitchell was possibly just turned 11 by then, Ryan was 13. How do you tell... How do you tell your sons that... <clears throat> Not only is your sister dead, but your uncle is responsible. How do, you, how do you word that? Um, so our FLOs came round and we, we asked them to be here while we told them. Um, and we, we told them exactly that. Your sister's been murdered and, and this is who's responsible. I don't think Mitchell really comprehended it. Ryan did, I think, and they just disappeared upstairs and um, our FLO went up and and um, spoke to them and, and they were fine, but I never ever thought I'd be in a situation, A, to tell my sons that their sister was dead and to tell them that a family member was responsible. That was probably the point where I thought, well, I've, I've got to accept this is what's happened and I'm never gonna see her again. Nearly one year after Danielle went missing, Stuart Campbell goes on trial for her kidnap and murder. By the time we came to trial in November, we had uh, obtained huge amounts of circumstantial evidence. On this occasion, we didn't have a body, we didn't have a deposition site, but we did have a scene of crime in so much that we had the searches at Stuart Campbell's home address. 
because of the absence of a body, we had to prove negative. So we had to show that as a 15 year old girl, Daniel wasn't worldly wise. She was afraid of the dark. She wasn't the sort of person that would simply have run away. And we had to prove things like the fact that she hadn't taken a mobile phone charger. She hadn't taken a change of clothing and she had no money. All the things you'd expect a young person to do if they were planning on running away from the family home. I went every day, Tone went, and I would say 90% of the time, but he still had to earn a living. So, I mean, I went every day. And there were things I heard that I really didn't want to hear, but you're almost compelled that you, you need to hear it. It wasn't pleasant, a lot of it, but I think come that point, there wasn't a lot else that could upset us, to be honest. On the first day I went up to report on the trial, Miles were uh, immediately drawn over to, to where Campbell was sitting in the box, and I just remember him seeming... It definitely had an air of, of confidence about him, that he seemed unfazed with what was going on around him, what the prosecution was saying, what he was being accused of. Almost bordering on arrogance, I would have said. I don't think I looked at him at all. I couldn't... Just the fact that he was in there was <laughs> quite hard. During trial, I would see Linda in, in the public gallery and it sticks in my mind of just how upset and, and traumatised... Um, Linda seemed and you couldn't help but feel for her it was, it was a very emotional time Campbell was very quiet while sat in the dock I mean, and um, at all times he, he had to have a connection with his, his defending team Let's say passing notes if he was not happy with a, uh, one of the witnesses it quickly would be scribbled notes through clearly he, he wanted to have some certain amount of control over what was being asked of each witness we would never have got through it without the support we had from family and friends, but I think the support of our FLOs was outstanding. I really don't think we would have got through it without them. It was a long, long trial, long trial, harrowing. The 11 week trial finally draws to a close. Following the jury's deliberations, they returned a verdict, a majority verdict of guilty of murder and guilty of kidnapping Danielle. I can't think of a situation that is, is worse than being someone that you've trusted, trusted your, with your children, let into your home, be part of your life, do something so horrendous to someone that supposedly they thought the world of. How? I can't co comprehend that even now. I think life should be life, but he got a sentence of 23 years. I was elated, most of all for Tony and Linda, but also for the investigation team and everybody on Essex Police who had worked so hard for almost two years. I live with guilt quite a lot because you protect your children you like to think you'd protect your children and obviously I thought I feel that I let her down I didn't protect her had I known possibly what she was going through I could have done something about it but I didn't and I feel guilty that I wasn't aware of that and I just feel guilty that I wasn't able to protect her which was as a mum is your job and I, I didn't fulfill that job for her he's still alive and still will come out with a life at the end of it and she never will. But to say where her body is, got to admit he's done it, and I, I don't know that he ever will. But we still haven't got our daughter back, and that is that is torture. After the trial, I hosted a press conference with the media, and during that time, I made the declaration that Essex Police would never stop searching for Danielle's body. Until Danielle's body is found, this case remains open. In May 2017, 16 years after she disappeared, police get a tip-off about a possible burial site. Just last year there was um, some information come to light and um, a number of garages were um, demolished and um, dug up uh, in the hope that actually this is going to be where we expect to find Danielle. So obviously I was with the family again, um, going down, keeping them informed of what was happening. At the time, I remember being quite optimistic that 
Danielle's body was going to be found and there would be some closure for Lind Linda Tony and, and the rest of Danielle's family. Whilst we were all hopeful this would produce some evidence, I wasn't confident knowing how intense the searching had been during a 12-month period of the investigation. So after all of these efforts by police, there's no body found, um, and I couldn't help but think just how horrendous that must, must have been for Tony, Linda and, and their other children, that, that Danielle wasn't found and, and they weren't able to, to lay her to rest in the way they'd want to. Linda's desperate to get Danielle back now. Now, even now, she's desperate. That's all she wants is Danielle back to actually bring her home. To get 100% justice, which is getting her back, without that, we're, we've been robbed of some of the justice that she deserves. And she does deserve that. She deserves to be brought home and... <coughs> and put somewhere nice, not just discarded, which is what she has been. The only thing I would say to him, if he ever was in a position to listen, is to do the right thing. Just once do the right thing. And give her, give her back to us.